Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Just uh, I start with a technical notice because there was a question in the chat. The seminar will be recorded and then uh, we'll try to share the link on YouTube uh, with uh, uh, the most people we can. Um, we are really glad to have today uh, here Jacopo Trevilli uh, from ICTP and in particular from the Quantitative Life Sciences Group, uh, which is uh, and who is leading the group uh, Quantitative Ecology and Evolution. And today I'm going to be very brief and it's going to just talk to us about what is a typical microbial, microbial community. Thanks a lot for the introduction. So I'll take out the mask. I'm sorry if I have to sit, but uh, otherwise I'm not. Ah, what happened? It's okay? Okay, good. Okay. Everything is in place. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for, uh, for the invitation and uh, for you for being here. And um, uh, yes, so just, uh, uh, I mean, a few things before uh, I start uh, speaking. So um, in general, I'm, uh, we are interested in uh, ecology and evolution. And um, here are the pictures of uh, some of the people that are uh, involved uh, in my work. Uh, some of them are uh, actually here. Uh, and um, oh, okay, sorry. And uh, in general, uh, the problems we are interested in are problems uh, that relate highly diverse ecosystems. So communities, ecological communities, where there are many, many species uh, coexisting uh, in the same environment. And uh, we are mostly interested, I mean, we are interested uh, in theory, so theoretical mathematical models that describes the dynamics of these populations and uh, in uh, data, typically for microbial community coming out of uh, uh, environmental sequencing. And we try to connect the two. So we try to use theory to um, develop ideas on how to, to look at this data and uh, use data to inform ways to model and to develop new theories. And of course, uh, in theory, everything is well connected. In practice, this is a very hard uh, things to do. And so uh, well, we do what we can, but just this is just to say that we are interested in anything uh, in between these two extremes and also in these two extremes themselves. Okay, so this is the outline for today. So uh, I know that uh, I guess most of you uh, don't know much about microbial communities or microbes. So I have a sort of uh, long introduction of why it's interesting to study microbial communities and uh, what kind of questions I find interesting, which are, of course, not uh, at all representative of uh, what other people working in microbial ecology find interesting. Uh, and I'd like to also have some more, I don't know, philosophical part on the approach I like, what uh, kind of question I like to ask and how I like to solve. And then I'll uh, present uh, some recent results uh, uh, in this context. Okay, so, uh, well, the first reason of why to study bacteria and microbes is because they are uh, everywhere, right? And so you know that they are everywhere because, I mean, they populate our body. We have uh, more uh, bacterial cells uh, in our body than uh, uh, human cells. They are on every surface uh, in this room, uh, on every uh, part of, uh, of your body. But th they are interesting also because they are really everywhere and uh, with everywhere we mean so also, we also mean the most extreme uh, um, environment on earth so for instance this guy here on the right on the left uh, is um, an archaea so a type of microbe a prokaryote that lives in hydrothermal vents so down deep uh, in the oceans and uh, the optimal temperature for its growth is uh, above 100 degrees celsius so this is not that he can survive like doing some sports. He reproduce at the mass maximum growth rate at the minimal doubling time, where he is at uh, 106 degrees. And below 90 degrees, it freezes. So it stops reproducing. Okay. And uh, so temperature is one of these extreme environments. Another one is uh, pH. So this is uh, another archaea that survives uh, at high temperature at very, very low pH, so in very acidic environments. Um, and uh, this guy here, it's a bacterium uh, that the story here was, uh, it's interesting. So this is uh, apparently in the US, you can buy these uh, irradiated ground beef. So you, it's basically brown ground beef that has been uh, irradiated with very high level of uh, ionizing radiation such to 
eliminate all the all the bacteria that are inside and uh, someone opened this uh, package and was spoiled okay and so i mean i don't know perhaps there was uh, i'm making this up but uh, there was some biologist uh, nearby and so they tested what was there and they found this uh, this bacterium here which is actually to survive very high level of uh, ionizing radiation can survive cold dehydration vacuum survived like three years in outer space so it's really um, remarkable right so the point here that i want to make is uh, beyond the sort of super quark uh, or uh, um, bbc kind of uh, of uh, introduction is that uh, bacteria and prokaryotes are extremely adaptable so even if they are uh, very small uh, compared to eukaryotic cells they are able of incredible adaptations and on survivors in incredible environments now this is not just a curiosity uh, these bacteria are also involved in uh, extremely important uh, uh, things that happen on, on our planet uh, and so there is this quote that uh, Pasteur said or someone said that Pasteur said it uh, that uh, life uh, will not uh, remain possible on Earth without uh, the presence of, uh, of microbes. As for instance, probably as you know, uh, many bacteria and archaea are, are involved in uh, biogeochemical uh, cycles, like uh, uh, the nitrogen cycle, which is essential for, uh, for uh, plants to survive and grow, and, uh, and to, to the fixation of nitrogen. And uh, also, they are essential for our uh, functioning. So for instance, they are responsible for the synthesis of many uh, of some vitamins that we will not be able to synthesize otherwise, like vitamin K2 in, uh, in, uh, in our gut. And uh, even if uh, perhaps Pasteur was a little bit too radical, and uh, I mean, I suggest uh, this actually reference to, to see a really, uh, I mean, uh, scientific uh, um, approach to, to how will be a world without uh, microbes. It's still uh, very true that they are essential, they're very important for many processes that happen on Earth. And so understanding how this community uh, function, it's important, OK? Um, and the, the next step is that, uh, OK, we see these cycles. We see these bacteria that survive extreme environments. And they do all these uh, interesting uh, chemical. They are responsible for all these uh, interesting chemical processes. But they don't do them in isolation. So there is not uh, just one species of bacteria that do these things, but they live in uh, complex communities. And uh, so this is an example. This is actually an experiment that, in principle, you could do at home. So I tried and I failed. But uh, I mean, I, I'm still waiting, let's say. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's very hard to get these beautiful colors. And uh, this uh, experiment here, this uh, column, is called the uh, Vinogradsky column. And uh, basically, what you have to do is to put uh, in, a, in a jar uh, some mud, uh, a source of carbon, like a shredded paper, a source of uh, sulfur, like uh, egg yolk. And uh, you mix, and you wait. And what happens is that uh, there is uh, a gradient that creates with from oxygen-rich uh, uh, communities on the top, uh, oxygen-rich uh, environment in the top, and sulfur-rich uh, environment in the bottom. And so the community is stratified along this gradient. And if you're lucky, this gradient also corresponds to different colors. Okay? Now, in practice, uh, you often get something which is brownish, greenish, but uh, with some, uh, yeah. Uh, but this is the same phenomenon of what you see, for instance, in uh, these uh, beautiful hot springs, uh, uh, like this one is uh, from Yellowstone National Park. I mean, and to have an idea, of how big this is, this is a person that you see here, this is a road. And uh, this is the same phenomenon. And uh, this is uh, like uh, um, what happens due, due to a gradient of temperature. So since you have this gradient, sort of the community separate and you see uh, different species. And these species, based on the reaction they perform, produce these colors. OK? Now, one point is that uh, this has been known for uh, several decades. But what happened in, uh, uh, in, uh, in bacterial ecology in, let's say, a little bit more than 30 years ago is that people realized that uh, using uh, sequencing, so sequencing uh, the, the DNA that was contained in an environmental sample, uh, so not culturing bacteria and sequencing uh, these species one by one, but really taking a pool of DNA and uh, amplify some, uh, some gene and, uh, and sequence that, they were able to identify uh, species. Okay. And so 
you can basically, with uh, some uh, bioinformatic and uh, experimental processes, you can extract the DNA in, uh, in an environmental sample. So you can take a swap of, these, uh, of the surface of this table. And uh, after this, you know uh, which uh, DNA sample are present, and you can reconstruct which species are present. Okay? And the big surprise that was very apparent when people started doing that uh, with environmental sample is that on one end, you have these very beautiful uh, colors and uh, this very neat and clear uh, uh, separation of species. On the other end, if you look inside, you have a very high dimensional ecosystem. So you have many, many species that coexist in the same environment. And uh, these communities are not composed by few species, but they are composed of many, many, many different species. Okay. And uh, of course, this is, uh, uh, I mean, represent uh, an opportunity for anyone interested in uh, uh, high dimensional data set in the sense that this is clearly uh, a, a source of data where you have many, many uh, different dimensions and very complex uh, data sets, but also represented for, for ecologists, or at least in my opinion, it represents that it represented for ecologists an uh, unprecedented opportunity in the sense that ecology uh, is uh, in some sense still a, a, a discipline that uh, evolved uh, from uh, like going around with a net collecting butterflies where it's very hard to get very large data set and uh, despite how messy these data are they for the first time they produced a level and a quantity of data that was unprecedented so this represents uh, uh, an interesting opportunity for people interested in ecological questions to and in evolution questions to really ask and interrogate very large uh, data sets. But the point I want to uh, sort of uh, underlie with this, uh, with this example is that uh, you see that uh, this community, well, you have these beautiful colors, they separate, but you see that you have many, many different species. And a natural question, which is non-trivial to ask, is why? Um, why there are, uh, these communities are so diverse? why the abundance of these species varies a lot uh, in time and space. Um, and this question is a very fundamental question in ecology. So in some sense, you are asking why ecology, which is the study of populations that interact, exists in the, same, in the first place, right? Why don't we have just one population of bacteria that is able to do everything, and instead you have this uh, diversification? And even if this question can seem, uh, I mean, some sense a radical question, or a, uh, it's really a fundamental question of, uh, of the processes that shape and determine coexistence in this community. Now, as any fundamental questions, sort of try to answer it is a little bit going into a rabbit hole. And for sure, I, I will not present today um, an answer to this, uh, to this question, but I think it's like a big motivation of uh, what I do and uh, why I do it. Okay. Um, Ah, one thing that I forgot. So, uh, of course, uh, at any point in this presentation, please uh, feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, so we don't have to keep the questions at the end, I think. But, uh, okay. Now, <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, uh, now the question, and this is uh, perhaps a little bit philosophical, but the question of why there is a coexistence, why there are so many species living in the same environment is a question that can be asked at many different scales. There is a special scale we could ask this question at the micro scale, so the scale that is comparable to the uh, cell size of uh, bacteria, so a few micrometers, to the global scale, right? And similarly to different uh, temporal scales from scale which is similar to the application of, of a single bacteria, so some tens of minutes to the, the time scale of macroevolution, so in this case of uh, the case of uh, bacteria. Uh, tens of years or hundreds of years, and uh, to different organizational scales, right? So, as you know, uh, the, the concept of a species, it's uh, not uh, well defined, it's not a rigorous concept, and one can define these, can group individuals uh, in, in different ways, and so one can ask how diverse is a community at different levels of, of this organization. Uh, my belief is that uh, there is no singular natural scale at which to study this community, but in some sense, uh, there are uh, 
unique patterns that emerge at any of this scale, and there are unique biological processes that determine these patterns. And uh, one, uh, I mean, it's interesting to study them all in some sense. Okay. Uh, so the question I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll try to answer today, uh, or I'll ask today, is not really why there is uh, diversity, but how uh, diversity of microbial community is organized, uh, and what are the leading processes determining the, the variability that we observe at one particular scale. Okay. So why do we observe this variability? How this variability is shaped, and what kind of model can describe it? Um, and uh, to answer this question, of course, one can use many different approach or declinate this question in many different ways. The approach li I like is to view these communities as uh, statistical ensembles. So um, in some sense, it's very natural for statistical physics and uh, is to imagine that this community, I mean, not to focus on questions that are species specific or population specific, where I want to know why this species has this abundance compared to this other, but where I look at a community as a realization of some stochastic uh, um, problem, and I look at the statistical properties of this community, community with the understanding that these statistical uh, properties are somehow related to fundamental mechanisms. And uh, this approach is not uh, something that actually stemmed from the uh, uh, sick mind of some statistical physicists is something that was developed uh, inside ecology and is called macroecology. And uh, exactly as I said, is the study of uh, ecological community as statistical ensemble. So where you try to describe the statistical properties in the same way as uh, if you have a tank of gas, the best way to, um, the best way, the, uh, in some sense, the most appropriate way to describe it is not to focus on the movement of single particles, but describe it under um, the, the using uh, probability and, uh, and uh, describing the statistical properties. And uh, so the second point of this sort of research program is to then try to identify which models uh, that can have some, uh, uh, that are simple, but have some biological grounding and uh, can be interpreted in terms of uh, ecological mechanisms reproduce these, uh, these statistical patterns. And then, uh, of course, going back and forth between data and models, understand how the model fails uh, and uh, try to use the, 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 the failure of this model to understand which feature of the data are actually important and relevant and contain uh, some biological information that was not uh, um, introduced in the model and then uh, try to add mechanisms to the, to, the, to the model and sort of go uh, back and forth. And uh, well, not surprising, there has been uh, many work uh, uh, trying to develop this uh, microecological view of uh, uh, microbial, uh, microbial communities. And uh, my work sort of goes, uh, our work goes in this, uh, in this line. So if you, even if you don't uh, believe uh, in uh, all the assumption on whether it's possible to understand something about the biology by looking at uh, statistical patterns, uh, I think that another way to, to ask the question I asking is the following, so very operational. So suppose that you want to generate some uh, data in silico that have the same statistical properties of the empirical data. So you want to generate data where you look at the, the abundances and typically they vary in the same way as the abundances of empirical communities uh, vary and the difference between species is the same, etc., etc. And uh, you can imagine this to do it in a sort of adversarial setting, right? Well, you have to make it harder and harder to, to some expert to understand that these data are not, uh, are not um, uh, are in silico data and to distinguish between the two. What kind of rules you should put in? Right? What are the, the ingredients you should put in to make it harder and harder to understand that these are actually in silico data? Okay? So this is another way to sort of motivate what I, um, I'm going forward, I'm going uh, after. Okay, so this was the end uh, of the introduction. I don't know if there are questions, comments. Okay. Good, so what I want to start now is to illustrate what I believe is the sort of uh, ideal gas of uh, microbial communities. So the simplest, uh, 
model, which is wrong, but uh, is uh, useful, <laughs> okay? Uh, so it represents a sort of baseline on which to, sort of a pay playground on which other mechanisms could be add added, okay? Um, <laughs> Okay, so this is just a slide on what kind of data. So uh, the data I'm gonna present are uh, I mean, obtained from environmental sequencing. So sequence is the genetic material contained in some environmental sample. Uh, these are both uh, uh, amplicon sequences. So when you amplify a particular gene, uh, which is a marker gene and is used to identify different species, but also metagenomic data where you uh, sequence the whole uh, genome, the whole DNA, uh, in, uh, in, these, uh, in these environments and you reconstruct species. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, it's, not, uh, I mean, it's not super important to understand the rest of the talk. This is just to say that uh, this is the kind of data where, uh, where it comes. And I will not focus on one particular environment uh, biome. I mean, the, the goal is to develop something that is uh, general enough. And uh, in this case, when I talk about species, these are operational ta taxonomic units at 97%. Again, if you don't know what this means, this is just, uh, you can imagine that you have many sequences and you have to somehow decide whether two sequences that are somewhat divergent belong to the same species or a different species. And uh, there is an arbitrary parameter, which is a similarity parameter that determines uh, the cutoff on which you define, okay, these two individuals, these two sequences are two different species or the same species. And uh, uh, this is one standard uh, uh, Good. Okay, let's go back to this. So let's start from the end. So what is the simplest model, uh, the, the least wrong model to describe uh, this data? I believe that this is the, the, the model. So it has the form of uh, Langevin equation where you have the abund you describe the dynamics uh, of the abundance of uh, species i, type t, and you have two terms. So you have a term which is a uh, uh, logistic growth uh, term, which describes the fact that populations, uh, uh, when they are very rare, so when this term does not uh, exist, they grow exponentially, but then uh, there are limitations in the environment, and therefore the population uh, arrives to a saturation. Uh, and uh, so if you take a class in uh, population biology, uh, ecology, this is the probably first class you take, you study this model, if it is a theoretical or a mathematical one. And then this term is a fluctuating term, so this is white noise, and this describes, and this is a multiplicative term, so the amplitude of these fluctuations depend on the uh, population abundance. And uh, this term here represents the fact that you have uh, fluctuations in the environment, so the fact that uh, these uh, species fluctuate because the growth rate of these species uh, change in time on a, a rapid time scale. <coughs> and um, sort of, uh, I propose this, this model and I'll illustrate the, the evidence for this. And at the same time, this other group proposed the same model to describe uh, the dynamics of microbial communities. And uh, I'll present why I believe that this is the simplest uh, uh, sort of the an interesting starting point to model these, these communities. The K? Okay, so basically you, we have three parameters here. So uh, one is K, K is the carrying capacity. So represents, if you wait, I mean, if there was no stochasticity, so if you shut down stochasticity and you wait for large times, you expect that your population arrives at this carrying capacity. Now, this tau here represents the typical time scale of the process. So there is sometimes you, uh, well, you can imagine two things. If you shut down the, the stochasticity, is the time it takes to arrive to the carrying capacity. If you have stochasticity, it determines the typical, uh, uh, the, time, the uh, autocorrelation time scales of your trajectory. And this sigma represents the, the um, amplitude of, of the noise. So if sigma is zero, you don't have stochasticity. And then as you increase stochasticity, you, you increase the fluctuations, okay? When you have stochasticity, then the species is expected to fluctuate around the value, which is proportional to K and also depends on the sigma. But everything can be calculated. Other questions? Okay. 
So what's the evidence? Well, one prediction that these models uh, does is that uh, if you imagine that you look at this trajectory or you take many different trajectories with the same parameters, and uh, you take a snapshot along these many different trajectories, what you can build is, you can get is the stationary distribution of this, uh, of this process, right? Uh, so this, let's say this process admits a, a stationary distribution and the stationary distribution describes distribution of abundance that for instance, you obtain if you take many different trajectories in parallel and uh, you have the snap, a snapshot for a trajectory and you build the histogram of these trajectories, okay? So, in practice, in the data, if you take a given species, and for instance, you look across communities, what is the distribution of the abundance? You should expect that the distribution of the abundance is the one predicted by the model. Okay? And uh, the distribution of abundance that the model predicts is a gamma distribution, and uh, also the data. So these are uh, collapse and average over species. But the point here is that the distribution of uh, uh, abundance, so how the abundance of species change across communities is gamma distributed as predicted by the model. Okay? And this applies also if you look at, instead of looking at different communities, you look at the same communities over time. Okay? Okay. So this is uh, the prediction and uh, I mean, the, this model can be solved analytically, and uh, it predicts that the, the uh, abundance distribution is, uh, the, the, the abundance is fluctuated as described by gamma distribution. Uh, now, this is a sort of stationary property that uh, the model predicts, but the model is uh, a non-stationary process, describes dynamics, right? So you can also test the model using property of the dynamics. Right? So, for instance, you have data sets like the one I presented where you look at, uh, these are gut microbiome. So you look at the gut microbiome, you, you take a sample from a person every day uh, for many times. And so you have a time series for each species of abundance. Right? And you can look at the dynamical properties of this time series. And you can see whether the model predicts the same properties. And in particular, the model, uh, well, let's start from the data. So here, what you look at uh, is the, well, in principle, to describe this data, this, imagine this time series, the all information of this time series is contained in the transition probability. So if a species, well, not all the information, but the first approximation, if the abundance of a species today is something, what is the probability that the abundance tomorrow is going to be something else? Okay. So it's natural to look at the first two moments of this probability distribution. So particular at the average abundance tomorrow, given the abundance today, and the variance of the abundance tomorrow, given the abundance today. So if you look at the average abundance, what you see is that there is uh, uh, the data, which are the color points, uh, are related to the abundance today. Uh, and in particular, you have to compare this with the gray line. So the gray line is what you would expect if you shuffle the data, so if you didn't have any dynamics. If you shuffle the, da the data in time, you expect that the abundance today is an informative of the abundance tomorrow. While what you say is that you see you have a memory in the data. So if today you are above carrying capacity, if you want, tomorrow you are typically again above carrying capacity because it takes some time to relax back. Okay? So this is one property. And the other property is that the variance of the abundance tomorrow, it's more or less uh, independence of the abundance today but it's below that what you would expect if you shuffle the data, okay? This is one pattern which is non-trivial and the model uh, qualitatively reproduces these two, these two properties, okay? Another way to look at this, which uh, was done in this paper, is that you can look at how the different of two different time points scale with the mean abundance and the model will predict that this is linear and this is what you say. And the width of the distribution of this ratio, which is related to the variance, is independent of the mean abundance. And again, this is what you expect from the model. This is to say that the model not only reproduces statical property, equilibrium property of the dynamics, so how the dynamics look, I mean, how the communities look like if I take snapshots of this community, or if I aggregate the time points, but also predict properties 
of the transition between one point and another. Okay. Yes. 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 The model is predicting yes. Yes. So yes. So these are different, different yes. So these are three data. So these actually are three body sites. So uh, I don't. Uh, I don't. Have, I think this is gut. This is uh, skin. So it's the, the the palm. So it's one end. I don't remember which one. And uh, this is. Uh, it's actually metal if it's right or the right. But and uh, uh, this is the, the oral microbiome. Um, yeah. And this should be all gut. Okay. Uh, okay. So what one can do with this is that uh, um, well, one thing that you learn uh, after doing this is that basically you can characterize the properties of uh, one species. So our species fluctuate. What is the the variability of a species abundance by a model that in print, I mean. If you look at the statical properties, so the stationary properties, uh, this distribution here is a gamma distribution which depends only on two parameters, right? Which uh, you can identify in the model as the carrying capacity and this variability here, because of course the time scale doesn't matter for the stationary properties, which you can also interpret as the mean and the variance, okay? So say it in a different way, if for, any, for every species I know the mean abundance and the variance of abundance, I can I, I know these two numbers, I can construct a matrix that then I can give to the person I was uh, talking uh, before, and then this person can try to distinguish between this data and empirical data, right? So I have a way to generate a uh, realistic data set with just two numbers per, per species, okay? No, it's wrong, because the slide is, lot, is yeah. wrong. Yes, there is an X missing. Uh, thanks. So you have these two numbers. So a natural question you can ask is, well, but are these two numbers for each species independent? So is the variability of abundance independent of the mean abundance? Okay. And the answer is no. So, sorry. Uh, the variance is uh, um, proportional to the mean squared, meaning that the coefficient of variation is uh, at least approximately constant across species. Or said in a different way, this uh, parameter sigma here uh, I mean, if you interpret this, if you assume that this is the model that generates the gamma distribution, this parameter sigma here is approximately constant across species. While this parameter k is what varies. This is not evident if you don't know the solution of these equations, but this is what this tells you. And so in a more practical way, it means that if I know the mean abundance of every species and I know one additional number, which is the intercept of this line, I can generate this data, okay? So we are left with just one parameter per species, which is the, which is the mean abundance. And then you can ask, <coughs> you can ask, okay, but how is this mean abundance or the typical abundance of each, spe of each species distributed across species? So you look at that and you find, again, another pattern which is very uh, robust. And this is that the mean abundance is actually log normally distributed across species. You don't see a full log normal because, uh, of course, in all this data, hidden under the carpet, you have a huge sampling uh, process, right? So if I take a sample of this, uh, of the community living on this table, I will not see all the sequences uh, that are on this table or their, I mean, or their, I don't know, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 uh, sequences that uh, individuals that are here. I will see just uh, a small fraction of this community. So the most rare species, I, I will never see the most rare species, okay? And so this translates into the fact that this distribution here is described by a log normal, but you, you only see one tail of the distribution, okay? I don't know if that is clear. Okay. Say it in a different way. If you assume that the true average abundance of these species are log normal, and then you simulate the fact that you have uh, this experimental protocol, which also as a sampling errors, what you expect to see is not the full log normal distribution, but a log normal distribution which is cut at a point which depends on your sequencing depth, your sampling, I mean, all the experimental and processing steps you have taken. Okay. But besides that, 
I mean, we have uh, now what what uh, you discover is that the mean abundance, abundance is logarithmic distributed. So if you know these parameters that uh, uh, characterize the the log normal distribution, you know these uh, these um, uh, the intercept of these of this curve, so the coefficient of variation. Then what you can do is you can generate this data, right? So with very few parameters, three parameters, one can generate these uh, in silico data sets. Okay, and then what you can ask is whether these in silico data sets have the same. I mean, you can check other statistical properties that uh, I have not introduced and not studied or not discussed with you uh, yet, or that were not explicitly used uh, so far, and see whether these uh, these uh, in silico data reproduce also, also these patterns. Okay, so for instance, what? Uh, okay, yeah, this is just to say that you can parameterize the model in order to reproduce this pattern. But this is just a parameterization. So in particular, if you fix that this sigma is constant, you reproduce this. And if you assume that this carrying capacity is log normal, you reproduce this. Uh, and if you assume also that you have this uh, sampling, you have the cutoff. OK. Now, for instance, one thing that you can look at, and this is a, a prediction. So you have your model. This is fully uh, parameterized. You generate the data. And then you can, for instance, you can ask, how many species do I observe? It's a function of the number, number of frits, number of sequences you have collected. You collect more sequences, you see more species because uh, you are far from saturation. But you can ask, do I, uh, do I see the same number of species in my in silico data as in the data set? And uh, the answer is uh, yes. So you see both. The, the same amount, but also you see the same trend with the number of reads, so in, with the, how much you have sampled the community. And just to give a line, so this line is the total number of different species that you see if you put all the data sets together, right? So in one community, you see these species, in one community, these other species, et cetera, et cetera. But still, the model is able to predict how many, how many you see in a typical community. Um, this is uh, another pattern, which is how many species uh, have a given abundance? So you have species that in a given community are very abundant, species that are very rare. Okay? And you can do the histogram within a community of the rarity of species. And you see that uh, the, the black line are the prediction, the, the, the colored lines are the data. <coughs> and again, you see the same uh, I mean, the good trend. This is another property, uh, which is the probability that a species is present in a given fraction of the sample. So you have abundance, but you also have present, present substance. And also, this is reproduced, more or less. And uh, this is the relation between occupancy. So how many times you see a species, so the fraction of samples, fraction of communities where a species is present, and the average abundance of that species. And again, you have a good agreement between, between the data and the prediction. Okay. This is to say that there are several other uh, properties, statistical patterns that people uh, have studied and characterized that are reproduced by uh, this model once these parameters are, are fixed. So somewhat those uh, uh, macroecological patterns that I showed before are enough to generate and reproduce all these patterns. OK? Any question? Yeah. The species, yes, this is uh, okay. Exactly where I'm going. Other questions? Here uh, it uh, fails a little bit more. So I, I can go back to, I mean, I, I think it's useful to go to the next part and then I have a qualitative explanation why I think it works uh, not as good as the other uh, here. But uh, yes, this is uh, a good point. So. I'll answer at the end. Yeah, okay. okay. Other suggest other questions, other questions. I mean, also suggestions, but other questions. Okay. Uh, so, as uh, was noticed by by someone in the first line, uh, this model is non-interacting. So I assume that uh, all these species uh, do not interact, and in particular, the trajectory of these species is independent of each other. Which, of course, I mean, since uh, we are talking about ecology is uh, is wrong and we know that species interact and uh, 
the growth of one species affect the growth of other species, etc. Et uh, <clears throat> and uh, in particular, and this is work done with Matteo Sirec, who is a PhD student in, uh, in Granada and Miguel Angel Munoz. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you can uh, clearly see how a model fails by looking at the correlation across species. So, um, well, I, what you can do is that in principle, you can build uh, a correlation matrix by uh, looking at the correlation between species abundance over time, for instance, or uh, across communities. So, you say when a species goes up, do you expect other, another species going up or down? Okay, so you look at the fluctuation of abundance and you look how whether these are correlated across species or not. <clears throat> and uh, now you have here a huge problem of, uh, of sampling because the typical number of samples you have is much lower than the number of, uh, um, of species pairs. So you cannot uh, estimate exactly the, the correlation metrics, but still what, something you can do is, for instance, to look at the, the distribution of correlations across species pairs. So you can ask uh, if I take a typical pair, what is the correlation that I that I observe? And you can compare it with, with what expected by the model. Now, the model in principle is not interacting, so you expect that uh, in the infinite size limit, uh, the correlation is a delta function in zero. But of course, you have finite sampling, you have fluctuations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you can sort of build an idea of what is the uh, finite size uh, uh, expectations for the correlations. Okay. Nevertheless, what you see is that uh, the model uh, does not predict the, uh, the the typical correlations you see. So um, the black line is what you obtain from one uh, generation of the model, and uh, the color points are the distribution of these correlation metrics. So you ask basically if the, the color points represent, if I take a pair of species at random, what is the correlation I expect? Okay. Uh, and uh, I mean, one thing that uh, is in principle not trivial is that these correlations is picked in zero, which means that most of the pairs are not strongly correlated. Um, but still you see wide deviations from the expectations. Okay. So the question is, okay, how can we um, modify the model to uh, generate this correlation. Now, one problem that uh, you uh, you have to to follow to to sort of confront confront you with confront with is that uh, of course you, if you add enough parameters you can reproduce all this correlation and then it's very hard to uh, to learn something from uh, from this exercise. Okay. So what we try to do is to go a little bit deeper in, in, uh, uh, in the origin of this correlation, both from the data and from the model perspective, and, some, and try to recapitulate some of the properties here. And let's start from a sort of uh, modeling view of this uh, uh, problem. So in general, I mean, this is what I, I described. Uh, you have a community, so you have different species, you have different communities, you take two species and you look at whether their abundance is correlated or not. Okay, so the fluctuation of abundance are correlated or not. And in principle, you, you build this matrix. Now, one can, can imagine that the processes that determine these correlations, let's say interactions, but it could be something else, are determined by the biological uh, features, the biological properties of these species. Okay? And I can imagine that these species live in some hidden uh, preference space, which is some i-dimensional space, where a species is a vector, and this vector represents the, if you want, the ecological niche of these species, or the resource preference of these species, or the environmental preference of these species. So whether the species like high temperature, low temperature, high pH, low pH, whether prefer this carbon source over this other carbon source, etc., etc. Okay? And now the angle between these two vectors represents how similar are these species in this preference space. And uh, in particular, we focus on two uh, different uh, uh, kind of uh, features or preferences. One for uh, resources. So you have resources, and these are consumed by the species. And other are environmental factors. And the main difference between the two I mean, 
in the way I'm sort of mathematically describing this is that resources are consumed. So um, the fact that a species prefer a resource, it also means that this affects the, 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 the abundance of that resource in the environment, while these environmental factors are not uh, affected by the species. This is not true for many things, for instance, pH, but this is the simplifications we are taking. <coughs> and uh, the question we ask uh, in principle in the model is, suppose that I have uh, two species and these two species have a given angle in this preference space. What is the correlation of their abundance that I expect as a function of their similarity? So do I expect that two species are positively correlated? Do I expect that two species that are very similar are negatively correlated? Do I expect that there is no signal? Okay. Now, uh, in principle, I mean, let's start from uh, some general model and see how we should shape our expectation. And um, uh, now, this is a sort of generalization of the model I, I presented before. So the model I presented before, now this is simplified in terms of the parameter, was a model where this matrix here was diagonal, so, and uh, this noise was not correlated. So this model has a term here where the growth rate of a species, the per capita growth rate, so this term divided by Xi, depends on all the species and all the abundance. So this is Otka Volterra, if you are familiar with the name. And we say species interact, okay? And so the, 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 pre, the, the abundance, the change in abundance of a species affect my growth rate. But then you can also see, okay, so species are affected, they fluctuate because there, are, there is environmental stochasticity, the environment fluctuates. And in principle, spe species that are similar, I mean, different species could perceive in similar way the fluctuations of the environment. So the effect of an environment fluctuations can be correlated or anti-correlated across species, right? So if temperature goes up, some species are both going to be more happy and the other they're going to both be sad. Okay? So you have also a source of correlation here. Now, the model I described before is a model where the off-diagonal elements of these matrix and these correlation matrix is zero, are zero. So there is no coupling. This is the model. But now we can introduce the coupling. Again, in principle, we can could say, well, I want to parameterize all these correlations to describe the final correlation, but then I'm going to learn very little. I think, I mean, it's then hard to test this model because I have many parameters to, to test. So what we said is, well, let's take this model with the hidden space. I have different choice I can make. So I have this, this preference space. And in particular, I can imagine that I have the case where two species are very similar. So in that case, the angle is zero. And when two species are very different, which in this case, they are perpendicular. Okay. And then let's say one scenario is where there is no correlation between the species, but they, their interaction depends on this preference vector. Another case is uh, when there, is, there are no interactions, but the correlation depends on the preference vector. And another case is where both depend on this uh, preference vector. Now, I, I don't show uh, that here, but this is the case. I mean, the idea of this first case is a case where there are some resources uh, and there, is, there are fluctuations which are independent of, of the species, and species consume uh, uh, similar resources if they are similar. The second case is where there is no competition between species for resources, but they are affected in a similar way by environmental factors which fluctuate. And the third case is um, there are resources that fluctuate. Okay? Uh, so these resources fluctuate and similar species consume similar resources. Okay? And so the interesting thing is that uh, we have three models and uh, we have three predictions that are different. Okay, So it's good because uh, clearly well, this is what the model predicts. Then we can go and see in the data and see what happens. Okay. So what are these scenarios? So this scenario is the limiting similarity. So it's the scenario where the competition depends on the similarity. So this is 
imagine that uh, there is a buffet and uh, we bought uh, like the same thing and we reproduce based on how much we eat. And since we are both limited by the same resources, if there is more than me, there is going to be less than, uh, uh, than I mean, Yuri if uh, it's the same things that I eat, right? Because we are limited by the same resources. So a positive fluctuation of me corresponds to a negative fluctuation of you. Now, imagine that the, uh, there are environmental factors that fluctuates. If we are similar, we are going to be affected by the same conditions. So since there is a common source of our uh, a common cause, if you want, of our fluctuations, we are going to uh, have a synchronous fluctuation, so positive correlated fluctuations. Now, the third case is a little bit harder to, to imagine. is the case where the resources I was uh, mentioning before fluctuates, right? So on one end, if we bought like pizza and there is more pizza, we are more happy because there is more pizza, but also we compete for the same resources and effectively uh, these end up, these two effects end up to cancel. And so these are not correlated. Okay. So how do we go and test this data? Well, we don't have access, of course, of this hidden space. Uh, we don't know how to infer this space. A big assumption that we can make is that evolutionary close species, so species that share a common ancestor, which is close, closer in time, are closer in this preference space. Okay. Uh, and uh, so what we can do is uh, we can look at whether similar species are more positive or negative uh, correlated in their abundance under the assumption that the similarity in uh, preference space is related to phylogenetic similarity. So how uh, close is the common ancestor? And uh, what we find in the data is that the correlation is positive. Yeah. Yes, this is, sorry, yes, I didn't. So this is using uh, 16S uh, uh, ribosomal DNA, which is the marker, uh, the accepted marker of, uh, uh, for, for bacteria to identify species. Uh, now, the big problem, well, let me go back to, uh, uh, sort of a part of the, the, the question in some sense. But this is an assumption, so that uh, if you, so this is a, sort of is used as a molecular clock, so to infer uh, the, the, if you want, the clonal tree, so how far is the common ancestor. And uh, what we find, what we find is that uh, the correlation is positive and, and decaying, which implies that uh, uh, the natural model is a model where these fluctuations are determined by uh, shared environmental fluctuations and not uh, by competition. Okay, so that uh, the, the, there are environmental factors or that are changing in time, which are not necessarily directly affected, or I mean, the, the way they are affected cannot be detected, uh, uh, and that these contribute to the fluctuations and species that are similar are affected in similar way. So now we have a model that reproduces this pattern, and so. We can, again, uh, try to do something with this model and predict other things. And uh, uh, what we did was to look at uh, the dynamics and sort of build a time delayed version of this correlation. So instead of looking at the correlation of the <coughs> abundance of two species, uh, in, well, I mean, these are obtained for different communities. You can repeat the same thing in time, so you can ask, whether the abundance of two species when looked at the same time is correlated, or you can look at the correlation between species also at different time delays. Okay, So you say, is the abundance of species A today correlated with the abundance of species B tomorrow? And so with the model, we can predict the decay of this correlation, uh, both in phylogenetic distance, now in time, and in, uh, in time, so how this goes down. Okay. Uh, now, to sort of go back to the previous question on uh, what is used, I mean, the big assumption here is that uh, phylogenetic distance is uh, um, representative of, if you want this preference space or the ecological niche uh, or in general, the function that these species perform in the environment, what, how they are affected by the environment and how they affect by the environment. And uh, uh, 
this means that the, the signal that we can see here is this also the signal of the kind of preference that are conserved on, on the phylogenetic tree uh, and allow to detect this similarity. What I mean is that suppose that um, metabolic traits, for instance, uh, are highly plastic, so they change a lot across the phylogenetic tree. We don't have any signal of phylogeny on the, this metabolic trait. And so we cannot infer from phylogeny what these species are doing in terms of uh, uh, consumption of different resources and therefore of competition. But somehow this is, uh, yeah. This one. Yeah. So these are time series. Oh, this is gut microbiome. Yeah, but you have you have three different scenarios for the for the model. Like ah, the DNA, you know, like yes, is the is uh, well the positive is environmental filtering. So this one. So it's the case where you don't have interactions here. You have a you have only a correlation. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you have to, of course, you have to determine, I mean, you have to fit, if you want, the mapping between this angle and the phylogenetic uh, distance, right? You don't have that. Yes, 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 exactly. It's robust. I mean, this is what determines the scaling. It's robust, and it allows you to then uh, go at different time. Exactly. And uh, what I was saying is that, I mean, these things is somewhat consistent with uh, how different... Uh, traits are plastic across the phylogenetic tree, so how much they are conserved. And typically, things that are related to environmental factors are more conserved, so probably they, there is more signal to pick them up. Uh, OK, so, so this is the conclusion. Uh, so I believe that uh, macroecology is a good uh, um, uh, way of uh, looking at uh, microbial communities. Um, the stochastic logistic model, which is the model that I uh, presented, uh, is uh, the right wrong model, meaning that I think it's a good playground to add uh, biological details. And this is what uh, we are developing also in other directions that I haven't presented here. And uh, uh, the phylogenetic signal in the correlations uh, suggests that. Uh, the main responsible uh, is due to correlated environmental noise. And at this scale, there is uh, uh, no uh, signal of uh, competition, which might be due to the fact that we are looking at uh, this phylogenetic distance uh, or the fact that we at the scale at which we are looking, we are still looking at uh, operational taxonomic units. So perhaps competition is something that happens at a finer scale and is not applicable here. And with that, I'd like to Thank you, and uh, well, I'm happy to answer more questions. There was one pending question. Your pending question. Oh yeah, no, it's. Uh... If you want, I don't answer. No, no, but, uh, it's fine, fine. It's no, I can answer. So the 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 reason. Yeah. 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 So. so... <coughs> Uh, okay, so my intuition is that, yeah. So the question was, uh, why for this pattern doesn't work as well as for others? Yes. So the reason is that all the other patterns are somewhat average over species. Okay. Now, when uh, you have, if you have a system which is uh, weakly correlated, and you average over species. You, the, the effect of correlation it's uh, negligible. Okay, so here clearly you have uh, correlations which are not explained by the model, but still the correlations are picked around uh, around zero. So most of the pairs are not correlated, so meaning that the correlations are sparse. Or I mean, this is in log scale, right? So you have a large tail, but it, it involves few pairs. So I believe that when you average. Over, over species, the effect of correlation sort of average out. And so a model which doesn't include correlation can reproduce the patterns. And the model meaning that, I mean, in some sense, another way to see the model is really a model where you 
fix the marginals of the of the data and you shuffle the data fixing the marginals this is what it does right because you are fixing the marginal distribution of the fluctuation of each species okay but you are, what you're shuffling is are the correlations and then you are looking at other properties now that patterns is not an average it's a distribution over species so that distribution over species encapsulate also the variability of species and the variability of species is affected by by these uh, this correlation this is my intuition um, i don't know if that is convincing yeah Okay, so we, this is something that we don't understand. Also, because the model, I mean, uh, the fact that the model is not symmetric is a finite size effect. Because the, the, the model should be, I mean, a delta or a Gaussian, right? Yeah. Uh, so this is uh, probably some term that are due to positive. I mean, the distribution of fluctuations is right skewed. So I think that this gives rise to this uh, skewness, which, I mean, the model here is, is run with the same number of data points that you have in the data, right? So uh, it's not run uh, for many data points. In, I mean, it's really done to try to reproduce the, 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 the fine effect, the, the, the effects you have in the data. Uh, I think that the reason why the model is skewed is because of this, uh, uh, the fact that the, the fluctuation distributions are right skewed. Uh, and so probably that effect has not converged yet. The effect on the data, uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, the, the, the model I have, which explains very little about this correlation, explains only the signal with phylogenetic distance, predict the positive correlations. If you think about this model, if you take this model as, if you imagine that this model is the only thing that matters, which is not, here you have only positive correlations, okay? Now, it's not the only thing that matters because here what, you're do, what we're doing is to bin over phylogenetic distance and mo the vast majority of the pairs are in this bin here. So are species that are distanced to each other. Right. So these contribute very little to the to the histogram. Um, what it means, well, I mean, one hypothesis is that actually, uh, I mean, the, 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 there are, uh, um, I mean, there are these factors that affect uh, some group of species together and therefore drives their positive correlations while leave unaffected the others. And therefore, don't drive, uh, don't have a negative uh, correlation uh, corresponding. But I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So yeah. So we don't know. We don't know. I mean, uh, yeah. But also, you see that these are, I mean, these are two experiments of the gut. You see that they are fairly similar, right? I mean, they they are both equally different to these. Right, so um, it suggests that it's somewhat uh, reproducible. I mean, we have not understand this. Very far from understanding this. Um, uh, this is also, uh, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, what, let's say uh, the challenge here is that one way to, I mean, of course, one brute force way is to introduce as many parameters as the correlation, so fully parameterize. Uh, these uh, correlation or these uh, interactions, and then you can reproduce everything you want, but that is uh, as perfect as useless. The other question is try to make simpler assumptions. So one thing that uh, is very interesting, I mean, many people are working on, is looking at uh, some uh, um, generative models for these interactions, like uh, imagine that these are random, and then uh, use that. Uh, Still, uh, there is not, uh, I mean, also this part, which is more theoretical, is not well developed. So 
here I'm talking also to a part of the audience, but uh, it's not well developed in the sense that these models, which are basically disordered uh, system models, so models inspired by uh, disorder, uh, uh, physics of disorder systems, uh, there is not well developed tools to connect those models with these predictions, so how these correlations, the distribution of correlations, this is not what typically is uh, studied with these models. So we don't know how to explain this. That's the yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the model of linear regression, uh, how do you choose the parameters that define the species? So the CI, the KI, and CI. So you use this one. So the KI, you say they are log normally distributed. So you basically you know that the average abundance and the mean abundance, so this sigma and this K. You need them to reproduce the mean and the variance of abundance. Okay. And yeah. so you can fix them using this. Yes. Okay. So you can do that. I mean, you can. You have different version of the models, right? You can have a model where you identify the species. Uh, and so you say species I is uh, Bacillus ovatus, and this species has a, uh, an abundance, an average abundance, which is 10 to the minus 2. and uh, uh, relative abundance, which is 10 to minus 2, and a uh, uh, coefficient of variation, which is uh, 1, and therefore that species is that species, or you say, no, I have an ensemble of species, I generate it from uh, this log normal distribution. Depends to the kind of questions. Yeah. So when you do the sample, the, then you the I mean, if it is something that is some reason, uh, I mean, there is some, no, it, I mean, uh, it's a sum of many things that are uncorrelated. So, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's, I mean, there is no, no reason why. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, remember that the way these are generated, so these are like, uh, they are gamma distributed and the coefficient of variation is very large, so they are very skewed, and you are averaging species with very different typical abundances. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, here there is a lot, uh, it's uh, also, I don't know, I mean, I, one of the motivation to go and look at this is because exactly, I, I'm not sure how to deal with this. I mean, I think that uh, before dealing with this, one should extract uh, some moments of this distribution and try to see uh, how relation between these moments, but we haven't done that so far. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, also you see that uh, these, I mean, uh, they have different widths, and this is because there are the, the amount of data is different. Right? So since every each one is matched to to all the to each data set, uh, uh, Okay, thanks a lot. I don't know if there was something in the chat, but I don't know. No, okay, sorry, thanks. <laughs>